Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar on using ultrasound to manage acute dyspnea at the bedside, presented by Dr. Dana Resop. The AIUM is pleased to present this event in collaboration with the American College of Physicians and the Society of Ultrasound in Medical Education. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. After completing this activity, participants should be able to discuss the benefits of point-of-care ultrasound compared to other imaging modalities in the acutely dyspneic patient, and participants should be able to explain how to determine causes of dyspnea by applying an algorithmic approach of ultrasound lung artifacts and through ultrasound cardiovascular examination. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Dr. Risop and Kathy Minton have no disclosures. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will be able to access the CME test and evaluation located on the AIUM website. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. During tonight's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time she will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now, we're pleased to present Dr. Dana Resop. My name is Dana Resop. I'm an ER physician at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, I teach the residents ultrasound there. Tonight we're going to be talking about how to use ultrasound at the bedside uh, and to manage acute shortness of breath. So as already mentioned, I have no disclosures. The objectives are on this slide and we already talked about them. I'd rather summarize them than go through them one more time. So tonight we're going to talk about how ultrasound is much cooler than CAT scan and chest x-ray for shortness of breath. We're going to talk about this and we're then going to go through how to do it. And we're going to talk about how to start with the lung ultrasound and then move on to add the heart, the inferior vena cava, and deep vein thrombosis ultrasound. So those of you who are listening to this already know that ultrasound is cool. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be listening to an AIUM webinar. However, there's a couple specific things that make it so it's worthwhile for you to walk over to the ultrasound machine, grab it, and bring it to the bedside, and a patient who's acutely short of breath. It takes time to do this, and so we want to make sure that it's worth your while. And the number one reason that I find is that it's flexible. So if you have a patient who's acutely ill in front of you, they can't lie down, they refuse to lie down in the CAT scanner, you can't get them to sit properly for a chest x-ray, then you can always take an ultrasound to the bedside and take a look at them in whatever position the comfort they have. If they're the trauma patient who you're worried about their shortness of breath, you can ultrasound them on the bed. And if it's a patient who's in an intensive care unit and has had surgery, you can always ultrasound them in whatever position they have to be because of their post-operative state. In addition to that, ultrasound is always immediately available. So for those of you who work in the emergency department, you know that when you need chest x-ray stats, they're always somewhere else in the hospital. For those of you who work someplace else in the hospital, you know that when you need chest x-ray stats, they're always in the emergency department. So either way, you can always grab the ultrasound machine that's closest to you and bring it to the bedside and find out what you need to do for your patient. CT scans are awesome for shortness of breath. They have fantastic sensitivity and specificity. They've uh, replaced most of our gold standards for everything else but they are always farther away than you want your patient to go. This floor map is actually a relatively straight version of how to get to CAT scans. 
because it doesn't involve any elevators, as I think most of our hospitals do in order to get to the CAT scanner. So for a patient who's acutely ill, zero travel time is always a good thing, which is what we get with our ultrasound. Chest x-rays are our most portable modality other than ultrasound, and they are just challenging. As those of you who know, if you look, uh, show a chest x-ray to three different physicians or three different uh, providers, you'll probably get three different answers about whether or not a patient has uh, congestive heart failure or pneumonia or something else. Particularly ultrasound versus chest x-ray is a, just a phenomenal tool about how much point of care ultrasound is better than the chest x-ray. Keep in mind that a lot of these chest x-rays are in various patient conditions. So there'll be a supine chest x-ray, which uh, I think pretty much everybody knows is a crappy study, very limited. So it's not a surprise to anybody that the sensitivity of point of care ultrasound is very high. The specificity is good too, not listed on here, because I think when the patient is critically ill in front of you, we care more about sensitivity than we do about specificity, but it does run in somewhere in the 90s to 80s. So moving on. What we're going to do for this ultrasound is we're going to try to talk about how to differentiate among all of these different causes of shortness of breath and how to narrow it down to just a couple and figure out what our treatment plan is going to be from the ultrasound at the bedside within really just a few minutes of ultrasounding our patient. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but it is a good example of how wide we have to think about uh, the causes for our acutely short of breath patient in front of us. We're going to start out with ultrasounding the lungs. So we start on the anterior lung, both sides, and we're going to be looking at the highest point looking for pneumothorax. We then move the ultrasound probes down the chest looking for A lines and B lines to look for signs of pulmonary edema. We move the ultrasound probes to the side. We look at the bases and the posterior lung fields looking for pleural effusions and consolidation. And then if we haven't figured out what we need to from that, we move on to the heart. We're going to talk only about two window views of the heart today. We're looking for the global ejection fraction, pericardial fusion, and signs of a pulmonary embolism. Then we move down to the inferior vena cava. And then if we still need to figure out if this patient may have a pulmonary embolism, we're going to take a look at the deep leg veins bilaterally to look for any signs of blood clots. What this gets us is it narrows this long list down into a couple things. We should be able to differentiate the causes of the lungs that are circled on the left, and we should be able to figure out the cause on the right from the heart if, the, um, if there's acute coronary syndrome that's acute enough or severe enough to have a global, uh, sorry, a focal wall abnormality, or if we have problems with ejection fraction or fluid around the heart. And then also if the patient has shock or hypotension, we should be able to figure out their fluid status from the inferior vena cava, and an idea of whether or not they have a pulmonary embolism. So let's start. We're going to start off with the lung. Thanks to Dr. Lichtenstein, who really um, brought lung ultrasound to the forefront of most of our uh, knowledge and ability to do this ultrasound, there's actually a, a wide variety of people who practice this kind of ultrasound. This is uh, Today's talk is not meant to be an extensive review by any means. Instead, there are two long AIUM webinars, which I highly re recommend you take a look at. Um, both of these are very good, and we'll talk about how to use this at the bedside and give you some more details that I don't have time to cover today. Just of note, this uh, second talk, Lung Ultrasound for the Emergent Pediatric Patient, although it is uh, listed as uh, pediatric patient ultrasound talk, it actually is uh, completely applicable to adults as well, which uh, for those of us who take care of adults makes sense, as we know that adults are really just big children. So there's four main things that we're looking at on the lung. We're looking for sliding, and we're going to look at A-lines versus B-lines, consolidation, and pleural effusions. Just as a quick review, and then we'll go into some more details, the lung on ultrasound is a little bit of a funky beat. So if you have air on the other side of whatever your ultrasound means, you and I know that we pretty much can't see anything. Oops. Sorry. I'm having a technical issue and can't get back to that slide.
All right, sorry about that. When you have the uh, air pocket on the other side of the chest wall, you really just get artifact and you can't see anything at all on the other side. No sliding, no change, nothing. However, if you have a little bit of pleura um, apposition with the lung on the other side of it, you get this submillimeter layer of fluid in between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura, which allows you to see lung sliding along the chest wall, which we'll be looking at for um, pneumothorax and also helps us see A-lines. If you have thickening or disease of the interstitial lines around the alveoli, you see a fluid around the alveoli or thickening like fibrosis, you'll see these long sort of spot-like uh, sort of lines all the way down to the bottom of the screen, known as B-lines. And then if we move, as we move on, these are actually, uh, finally we can see the lung itself. These three findings are artifacts, so we're not really seeing the lung, although the ultrasound does display what goes past that artifact. Here we actually finally can see what's inside the chest wall. So if you have fluid-filled alveoli, you'll see what looks like a consolidation pattern, so you'll actually be able to see the lung itself. And then if you have the lung sitting in a big puddle, obviously we can see the big puddle. So here's a large fluid collection, and then here's the consolidated lung below it. Moving on to talk about these in a little bit more detail. We're going to start off with sliding, which we want to start off with a high-frequency probe. And on the anterior chest, pretty much the highest point on the patient, because that's where a pneumothorax will have a tendency to be. What happens with this high-frequency probe is we'll see the chest wall in very good detail. So this is the muscle of the chest wall, rib, rib, and then the intercostal muscles. Here we'll see the pleural line, and below that is just the artifact that we get from that intact alveoli with all the air and the alveolar spaces. When the sound waves come out of this ultrasound probe, they can see the pleura moving around when the patient takes a breath. What that ends up looking like is this kind of little dots marching back and forth look that we see and uh, are familiar with as the sign of sliding. This indicates that this patient has no pneumothorax in this spot where we're looking at. So on the left hand here, we see a patient without uh, any pneumothorax. So they have good sliding. And you can get a couple of these little, what we call comet tails sometimes, off of the front of the anterior lung. You notice how that line kind of peters out as we get down to the bottom of the screen. That's what differentiates it from the B lung. On the right, we have, this is the skin, chest wall, intercostal muscles, rib, rib. Here's the pleural line. And you see that although the patient is breathing and there's shifting of tissue, there's really no sliding along that pleural line. So in this patient, we think that they may have a pneumothorax, but they also might have atelectasis. If they've intub been intubated, it might be a right main stem intubation. We don't know exactly what the cause of this is, other than that the pleura isn't sliding. When we find this, the next step is to take our linear probe and slide it down the anterior chest wall until we see what we're going to see over here, which is we get sliding again. So this is skin, chest wall. This is the intercostal muscle. And then right along here is the pleural line. Right here is where sliding starts, and here's where it stops. What's happening is the lung, the collapsed lung, is now starting to oppose the um, pleural right here. So now we have contact, and then we can see that sliding. This is the pathognomonic sign for a pneumothorax, and you really need to find it in order to see how big your pneumothorax is, as well as just proving that you have a pneumothorax if you're at the bedside and you're plan planning on putting a chest tube in. The next thing we're going to talk about are A lines and B lines. And for this, I usually switch over to the lower frequency curvilinear or phased array probe. I think it's just easier to identify B lines uh, on this probe than it is on the linear probe, and it is what we're going to use for the rest of the studies. So I start at the top where I was just looking for sliding, and then I move the probe down the anterior chest on both sides. What we're looking for is either A lines or B lines. So when the ultrasound waves bounce back and forth off of the air-filled alveoli, we should get this funny little repetitive pattern of uh, basically the echoes of the chest wall coming down. So we should see this repetitive line, line, line. You can kind of see it a little bit better on the periphery on this particular one. And those are called A-lines. 
if we have disease of the interstitium, thickening, or fluid, you instead get this line going all the way down to the bottom. Once again, I always feel like it looks like a spotlight. And it should erase the A-line and go all the way down. This indicates some sort of interstitial issue, like uh, fluid, too much uh, fluid in the lungs, fibrosis, those sorts of things. I find that they're easier to find at the bases of the lungs than at the upper sides of the lungs, which makes sense because you're going to have more fluid at the base than you will at the upper part of the lung. Just a couple B-lines here and there is not significant. It usually uh, it can be normal, especially in the lower fields. But if you have three or more, that's usually considered an indication that there's an issue like pulmonary edema. Interestingly, you can use this for fluid titration and shock because it will precede clinical shortness of breath or any hypoxia. So if you have a patient that you're giving fluids and they start to get more B-lines, you should probably stop giving them fluids. This isn't specific to any particular interstitial problem, although there are some ways to tell the differences between different types of interstitial problems, which I'd recommend you look at those previously mentioned lung webinars. But you can figure out if they have sort of the category of edema, ARDS. If you have a patient with uh, B lines on only one side of the lung, but not on the other side of the lung, it's highly indicative that there may be a pneumonia there. So we talked about doing the anterior lung field. When you finish that, I then move the probe to the side, look at the bases, and do the uh, posterior and inferior lung fields to look for consolidation and pleural effusions. The reason we can see the lung at this point in time is because if you have a fluid or consolidation up to the edge of the pleura, you uh, no longer have the air blocking you from being able to see everything. This is a normal lung right here. So this is up towards the patient's head. This is down towards the patient's feet. The probe is held like this, sort of along the axillary line. This is uh, the, the outside of the skin. This is the midline. So this is the spine right here, a little bumpy. And then this is the liver and the diaphragm here. And you can see as the patient breathes, that diaphragm shifts up and down. You also get a couple little helpful comet tails off that diaphragm that tell you that it's uh, intact lung. If you have a consolidation, you'll see this instead. So skin, liver here. This is consolidated lung. This is the diaphragm here. This is fluid-filled alveoli here, and then there's a couple little patches of air in the bronchi, known as air bronchograms, which you'll see shifting about as soon as I start this clip. So as the patient breathes, those little bronchi fill up with air, and you see that shifting air pattern. You'll see patterns similar to this, uh, similar to this in atelectasis. When we're looking for effusions, Instead of looking here at the periphery, we look down here next to the spine. So once again, outside of the chest wall, liver, spine right here, this is going to be a very tiny pleural effusion. So you'll just see a little triangle of the spine sign right here, an intact lung right next to it with that line coming down off the edge of it. And then this is a quite large pleural effusion. Uh, on the left-hand side, so spleen here, diaphragm coming down here, and then the, the Spine just continues here. The, uh, this is all fluid, and then the lung is way up here, kind of waving around in this water. Or purulent fluid. You actually cannot tell the difference between what this liquid is on ultrasound. Sometimes you'll see both. So here's a patient with pneumonia and a pleural uh, fluid collection. They may be developing an empyema. Here, because of where we're catching it, instead of seeing the spine, we're actually seeing a blood vessel, probably the IVC. And sometimes you'll see atelectasis. So this is a big piece of, a big compressed portion of the lung and a large collection of fluid. The difference between atelectasis and pneumonia is just what the air is doing on the uh, ultrasound. It's not shifting around as much in this lung. So to summarize our lung exam, we're going to start with a linear probe, high frequency, look at the top for lung sliding, move down if we find it until we find a long point. 
if we don't see any issues with the sliding, it looks like the lung is intact, then we switch to the curvilinear or low frequency probe and then look at the anterior chest wall all the way down to look for B line. And then we look at the bases bilaterally to look for pleural fusion and consolidation. If that's inconclusive, then it's time to move on to our other ultrasounds. And that's going to be the heart, the inferior vena cava, and the deep vein thrombosis that we're looking for. The heart and IVC ultrasounds are also covered in these uh, two AIUM webinars. Both of them have a lot of really interesting information about how to manage your patients at the bedside for a variety of problems, including shortness of breath, but also including things like sepsis and shock. The cardiac windows that we're going to talk about today are only two of the four major ones that we use. The two that we're not going to talk about include the sub -xyphoid which is a great view. You can see all four chambers of the heart. It's easy to get when you can get it uh, because uh, you go underneath the costal margin and the xiphoid process. You use the liver to push things away, so it kind of gives you a window. However, in my experience, patients who are short of breath get a big gastric bubble right about here, and then you really can't see a significant portion of the heart. The apical four chamber is a similar exam, phenomenal view of the heart. You get all four chambers. You can get a lot more detailed information about the right side versus the left side of the heart. However, as you can tell just by looking at this diagram, the lung, if it's at all hyperinflated, really minimizes how much lung window you get on this. And if you can't move your patient around because they're short of breath in order to get a better window, this becomes a very challenging view to get. Instead, we're going to talk about the peristernal long view and the peristernal short view. So the peristernal long view, you put the ultrasound probe right next to the patient's sternum in between two ribs, and you get a good view of the heart, in the, uh, mostly the left side of the heart, with the left ventricle and the left atrium, and a little bit of the right ventricle. We stay in the exact same spot on the chest and rotate at 90 degrees for this uh, the peristernal short view, where we get a good short axis view of the left ventricle and a little bit of the right ventricle on the side. We're going to use these two views to talk about how to see uh, effusion and how to determine if there's tamponade, talk about global function of the heart, and then also right ventricular dilation. So when we're doing this view, if you have your ultrasound machine set up with a cardiac view, then your indicator will often be switched over to this side. If you have your ultrasound set on a regular view with the indicator over here, you'll see the same images, but they will be flipped. So on this particular patient with the uh, cardiac view, what you'll see is the left ventricle, the base down here, the right ventricle above that, because as you're coming down here, you'll hit right ventricle, left ventricle. We don't really see the right atrium because the sternum and the lung block it from our view. Down here, we'll see the left atrium, and here's the left ventricular outflow track to the aortic valve, and sometimes we'll see the aorta here coming out. In live action, it looks like this. You can see it, sorry, you can see that mitral valve flipping right here and hitting the septum. It means there's good excursion. It's usually a sign of good ejection fraction. If we switch our probe to a short axis view, then we'll see this. So we'll have short axis view of the left ventricle, capillary muscles right here on the sides, and as this clip goes through, it's kind of starting at the apex of the heart and then tilting up towards the middle of the heart. And then we look at the right ventricle over here. You notice the right ventricle just kind of hugs the left ventricle, and the septum has good excursion all the way around, squeezes together with each contraction. When you see a pericardial fusion in the short axis view, this is what it looks like. So you have black all around the outside of the heart with that anechoic fluid there. This particular patient is still having relatively good movement and filling of the right ventricle. When you see it in the long axis view, it may look like this. So this is a pretty sizable pericardial effusion. This is the left ventricle down here, and then this is the right ventricle here. In order to determine if this patient has tamponade, we have to figure out if the right ventricle is collapsing during diastole. There's a couple sort of eyeball tests that you can use to figure this out. One of them is to look for the waterbed sign where the right ventricle is sort of bouncing up and down like this. So it looks like it's bouncing back and forth like a waterbed. That often means tamponade because that's what you'll see when the right ventricle is not filling correctly. 
In addition, there's also the trampoline sign, which you'll see here, where this right ventricle just seems like it's bouncing up and down. I always think it looks like a little guy bouncing up and down on the top of the right ventricle. If they don't have a pericardial fusion, then it's time to look for global function. This is a patient in PEA, so they obviously have very poor global uh, function. There are several studies, both internal medicine and also emergency medicine based, that say that physicians who have relatively limited experience in echocardiogram at the bedside actually are quite good at eyeballing how well the left ventricle is collapsing and giving a good bedside estimate of ejection fraction. So that means if you look at this and say that it's really poor and it's probably less than 10%, you're probably pretty right. This patient has very good ejection fraction. It's a little bit tachycardic, so it's a little bit hard to uh, clearly see how well their ejection fraction is going, but it's quite increased. In comparison to this patient, who has very poor ejection fraction as well. There's two things you can look at. One of them is how much the left ventricle is closing, and you can do this in short or long axis. In the long axis view, you can also look at the mitral valve. That mitral valve with good ejection fraction should give a little high five to the septum. And here it's barely opening. The last thing that we look at is you can, uh, in the parasternal short view, you can look for focal wall motion abnormalities like you might see in a severe heart attack. But the other thing we look for is what's called the D sign which is when the right ventricle is very dilated and pushing against the septum so that the uh, left ventricle is deformed a little bit instead of staying nice and circular like it's supposed to. This often uh, can be chronic or acute. In this particular patient, they also have a large pericardial effusion, and this is a quite noticeable defect. They're not usually this significant. If you can't figure out the answer, what you need to know uh, for your short of breath patient, then you can move on to the inferior vena cava. This often goes very well with the heart exam because it tells us how well blood is moving through the heart. It can also give you an idea of the patient's fluid status, which can be helpful if you're thinking they may be septic. This is a relatively normal inferior vena cava. You see that uh, this is up towards the head. This is down towards the feet. Here is the liver, and then down here is the inferior vena cava. When this patient breathes, this is just breathing at rest, that IVC collapses more than 50%, and that's pretty normal. This patient has significantly decreased collapse. They're still collapsing a little bit. Once again, this is a, a quiet respiration. This is up towards the head. This is down towards the feet. And this patient is uh, could be uh, concerning for congestive heart failure, depending on what your lung and your heart scan showed. This patient has basically whoops, has no collapse of their inferior vena cava. And they actually have a little bit of slow flow as well. You can actually see the flow on the ultrasound. So with quiet respiration, they're really just not moving their IVC at all. This is concerning for tamponade, just heart failure, pulmonary embolism. Uh, any of these can have this sort of a pattern. On the flip side, this is a patient who is probably a little hypovolemic. They have complete collapse of their inferior vena cava. And you'll often see this in patients who have issues with dehydration, although it can be other medical problems as well. If you suspect a pulmonary embolism, sometimes before you give somebody a uh, life-threatening medication like thrombolytics, you want to be as sure as you can be about the pulmonary embolism. So then that's when I like to add on the ultrasound for deep vein thrombosis. A couple of caveats for this is that about 20% of patients with a pulmonary embolism do not have a blood clot on their ultrasound of their extremities. And then only about 50% of the blood clots uh, seen after a pulmonary embolism are actually visible in the part of the top, the femoral and the popliteal veins. A little bit about the anatomy of the lower extremity, and that is there's a lot of veins. So blood clots have a tendency to show up where there's turbulence. So the saphenous comes into the common femoral vein, and there can be blood clots there. The deep femoral vein comes in here. There can be blood clots there. The three calf vessels come together at the popliteal vein, and you'll see blood clots there. In addition to that, 
you may see a blood vessel, a, I'm sorry, a blood clot that is extending from the iliac above the inguinal ligament. We can't really compress here or see the vein, but we can see it here. And you may also have an isolated femoral vein clot. In a study about um, emergency patients who had had radiology ultrasound, about 50% of their blood clots were seen in the thigh area, and about 15% were in the popliteal vein. There was a small number of them were, that were isolated. So it was only one small patch in the femoral vein or the deep femoral vein. And that would have made, that, that is unlikely to be caught on our quick and dirty ultrasound that we do at the bedside in a patient who's very sick. In order to for, perform this ultrasound, what we do is we find the ultrasound, uh, we find the veins and the arteries on the ultrasound screen with a probe. And then we compress the uh, probe until that vein collapses completely. So it will look like this. You'll find that vessel, collapse it, move down to the next spot, collapse it, move down to the next spot, and do it again and again. And you go all the way down the leg into the popliteal area. What it looks like on the screen is you'll see your circles with the vein circle should be collapsing each compression. And the artery circle should either stay open or just deform a little bit. Although if you push hard enough, the artery will also collapse. What it looks like as you go through the anatomy of the lower extremity is, if this is the right leg, you'll see the femoral artery, the common femoral vein, and then the saphenous coming in on the medial side. I argue that it's important to see the saphenous because it tells you that you've gotten all the way up to the top of the leg, pretty much as high as you can be expected to see. This increases your chance of finding something like an iliac clot come, extending down into the common femoral vein. When you compress your artery, common femoral vein, and saphenous vein, what you should see is the uh, common femoral vein and the saphenous vein should compress completely and almost and uh, disappear from sight or almost disappear from sight. You can move the probe down to the femoral, the mid-femoral area where there's really just two blood vessels, to the femoral artery, the femoral vein, and when you compress them, that vein once again should compress to basically nothing. When you move the probe down to the popliteal vein, the, the uh, vessels are in the exact same orientation as they've been all along, but you're now coming towards them at the back side. So your artery and your vein switch sides. So now the vein is on top and the artery is on the bottom. When you compress this, you should compress the vein on the top. So in the pop, the vein's on top is a common mnemonic used for this exam. This is what it looks like in real life. So this is the saphenous here, the common femoral vein, and the artery. And you can see that that common femoral vein is collapsing completely, as is the saphenous, and the artery is just being descended a little bit. It looks like there's some echoes in the inside of this artery. That's just artifact from the surrounding tissue. This is a curvilinear view of the same thing. The previous was linear. And on this, the uh, saphenous is right here. Common femoral vein is here. And then we notice a different uh, node of anatomy, and that is that there is an artery, a deep artery, that comes off the uh, femoral artery. There's also a deep vein, but we don't see that as well in this clip. But you will see the artery split into two. So we're compressing here. Compress the saphenous is up there. The common femoral vein collapses completely there. And there's those two arteries that I was talking about. One more time. You can see those veins collapsing completely, and the arteries are left here. Here's what happens when there's a blood clot. And in this particular patient, we can actually see the blood clot, which is helpful, but unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. These blood clots can be completely anechoic. So in this patient, this is the artery. This is the common femoral vein. This is actually the deep vein coming down off of that uh, common femoral vein. And then here's the deep artery here. You can see as they compress, the deep vein is compressing all the way, and the common femoral vein is partially occluded by this clot. If we move down into the lower portion of the thigh, what we'll see is just two circles. They're usually right on top of each other or pretty close. The femoral artery is on top of the veins on the bottom, and it should compress completely. This is a very good uh, job of compressing, and it pretty much disappears with it. This is what happens if there's a blood clot. We'll just see that artery collapsing. 
and the vein won't collapse. This uh, sonographer is pressing so hard that the artery is actually collapsing all the way and you know little pulsatiles, giving a couple little pulsatile beats here as we compress down. And that vein is actually where the clot is. When we move on into the palpiteal, like I said before, the palpiteal vein is now on top. What you should see is your palpiteal vein and your artery. And you'll see they start with the, the palpiteal vein and artery, but then very quickly they move the probe down and it divides into actually several groups of paired vessels, which are the calf veins. If there's a blood clot, you should see something like this. So we're compressing the arteries here, the veins here, and that vein is not compressing at all, telling us, us that there's a blood clot here, even though we really cannot see that clot at all. But we know it's there because it won't compress. So if you see a blood clot, obviously it's highly concerning that there may have been a larger portion of clot that's already broken off and is causing your patient's sort of breath. So to put it all together, we start off with the anterior lung at the top, and we look for lung sliding. Then we switch to the curvilinear probe, and we look for A-lines and B-lines across the anterior lung field before moving to the side. Continue to look for A-lines and B-lines, but also evaluating for consolidation and effusion. If we need more information, we move on to the cardiac ultrasound. We look at the parasternal lung and short views for pericardial fusion, the global function of the heart, and looking for right ventricular dilation. Then we move on to the inferior vena cava for an update on the fluid status to give us an idea of fluids actually moving through the heart and lungs, and it's maybe backing up there and keeping this patient from being able to breathe. And then last of all, we're looking at blood clots to see if there's any signs that this could be a pulmonary embolism. So let's do a couple practice cases to put this all together. Case one is a gentleman who shows up who's short of breath. He has a history of congestive heart failure, COPD, pulmonary embolism, has had a uh, heart attack with uh, bypass grafting and atrial fibrillation. And as many of our patients know their medications only by his shape, he stopped taking his little pink pill last week. When you do this long ultrasound, both sides look basically like this. So here you have chest wall, rib rib. If you look at that plural line, it looks like there's actually pretty decent sliding there. So unlikely to be a pneumothorax. Switch over to the curvilinear probe, and you're seeing this. Lots of spotlights coming down all the way to the bottom of the screen. I would say that's very concerning for significantly increased fluid or fibrosis. We look at the lung bases. One side is clear, the other side looks like this. So here's the chest wall, here's the diaphragm, here's the liver, and the spinal stroke continues this way. You see this curtain of lung coming across the anterior side, but there is this anechoic area right next to the diaphragm. which looks like it's probably a pearl effusion. We want to get a little bit more information, so we look at the heart. This is a peristernal lung view. There's the right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium. This is our mitral valve. A little bit of AFib there, but it's a good controlled rate. But the, the mitral valve is really not moving well at all and the left ventricle walls are not moving well either. We look at the IBC, and with respiration, see a little bit of heart artifact here, but with quiet respiration, we're really not getting any change in the diameter of that inferior vena cava. So we skip the deep veins, because we think we know the answer. The patient has sliding of lungs bilaterally, C lines throughout, a pleural effusion, poor cardiac function, and a non-collapsing IBC. So probably a good candidate to be diagnosed with congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema. Moving on to our next case, we have a patient who shows up very short of breath, standing low even though they're on supplemental oxygen and having a low blood pressure. Concerningly, they have a knee replacement three weeks ago. Even though they've been taking aspirin daily, it's obviously a concern for blood clots. So we look at the lung bilaterally, and this is what we see. Pretty good lung sliding. This is rib right here. 
You can see little ants marching back and forth on that plural line. We look for bee lines bilaterally in the bases. We have maybe a couple, not very many, not at all significant. Well, this is look about like this. So here's the diaphragm right here. A couple of comet tails off the diaphragm. The spinal stripe stops right at the diaphragm. So no signs of consolidation and no signs of effusion. We look at the heart. This is the left ventricle here. This is a peristernal short view. The left ventricle here, papillary muscles and the mitral valve. This is a pace maker here that we're seeing with its echo, sort of linear um, bring down artifact. But you see how the septum, instead of uh, contracting with the rest of the left ventricle, is actually bulging into the left ventricle. And this right ventricle is almost as large as the left ventricle, which is not common. So it's very concerning for right ventricular strain. We look at the anterior vena cava. Once again, heart's up here, anterior vena cava is here. With quiet respiration, we're seeing very minimal change. There's a little bit of collapse right here. That's just because of the diaphragm motion. Down here, there's no collapse at all. Moving on to the deep veins. In the mid femoral vein, on the right side, you see this. Sorry, the left side. So here's artery, vein. This is a um, superficial vessel up here that's collapsing out. But you see, even though we're deforming the artery and almost collapsing it completely, that femoral vein refuses to budge. So this is a large clot in the femoral vein. So we have sliding, mostly A line across the lung, no pleural fusion or consolidation, a dilated right ventricle of the heart, a non collapsing inferior vena cava, and a DVT. Say this is highly likely that this patient has a pulmonary embolism. The last case. We have a young man, 19 years old. He was admitted to the hospital a couple weeks ago for pneumonia. Got discharged last week. He presents with sudden onset of severe left-sided chest pain with breathing. This is his left anterior chest wall. So skin, muscle, rib, rib. This is the intercostal muscle. And here is the pleural line. That looks pretty suspicious for no sliding. So instead of moving on to the next part of the exam, we slide the probe down the anterior chest wall until we find this. This is skin, muscle, rib, rib, and here's the intercostal muscles, and here's our pleural line. And right here you see no sliding, and here we have sliding. So we've diagnosed this pneumothorax with a lung point. We now know that this gentleman needs the uh, if we're halfway down the chest with this, you probably need the chest tube. So in summary, ultrasound is cool. Uh, and when you're doing this exam, remember to start with your sliding on the anterior chest wall bilaterally. Switch to that curvilinear probe for the B lines on both sides. Check out the bases. Do your heart ultrasound. Look at the anterior vena cava. And if you uh, still need to sort things out, go ahead and check out the DVT ultrasound on the legs bilaterally. That ends this part of the presentation. I'm open for questions. Let's see. Dr. Resop, it looks like we have a couple of uh, questions. Are you able to see them? Yeah, I'm look yes, I am. So uh, the first one is uh, some is uh, recently seen studies on how much better uh, point of care ultrasound is in diagnosing pneumonia than chest X-ray. However, uh, I agree with you that says. However, I don't see how realistic it is to ultrasound the entire lung to find a small pneumonia you are suspecting. Putting gel over the entire thorax, both anterior and posterior. So the comment is that diagnosing pneumonia by chest x-ray seems faster and more realistic than spending a lot of time trying to find one small area of lung consolidation. And I absolutely agree with you on the smaller pneumonias. 
I think in a lot of our patients that we see in our uh, acute care setting, many of them do have smaller pneumonias that don't extend to the periphery, uh, and so we're unlikely to see them. I have seen a couple of pneumonias on chest x-ray, but usually I think that finding focal B lines in one portion of the lung and not finding it in other portions of the lung has been much more useful for me in uh, indicating that maybe pneumonia is the cause of the problem than actually looking for the pneumonia itself because it is, it is challenging if it's not a large enough pneumonia to extend to the periphery. The next question is asking about whether or not I use the phase cardiac probe for lung ultrasound at all, or for the most part, the curvilinear. And uh, honestly, I, I sort of use both. It kind of depends on um, how much time I have to switch probes around. If the patient is very sick, I usually just pick up the phase array probe in order to move through the exam a little bit faster. Um, you can see uh, sliding on the phased array probe just by changing the depth. And so I may just stick with that same ultrasound probe for all of the exams. It also means that you can see uh, in between ribs a little bit easier for the lung, the lung findings. However, the curvilinear, for many of us we call it the abdominal probe, it gives you a prettier picture. So if you have the time, I'll we'll often use that. And also, uh, just like the previous question, it's a little bit easier to see pneumonias, I think, on that curvilinear probe, just because it does give you a little bit better uh, um, visibility and detail. Uh, the next question is actually a, a really good question, going back to a lot of the research on uh, IVC. It's about, it says, can you utilize the IVC evaluation in both spontaneously breathing and mechanically ventilated patients? And is the sensitivity and specificity the same for each? And uh, the, the answer is you can use it on both of them, but uh, it's sort of like CVP. It's more of an exam of um, sort of the global picture. So if you see the IVC collapsing significantly, then it's helpful. If you see the IVC not collapsing at all, it's helpful. But you can't really differentiate in the spontaneously breathing patient if it's collapsing 30%, 45%, 60%, that sort of thing. It's, it's kind of an all or none sort of a diagnosis. My understanding of mechanically ventilated patients is that our sensitivity is a little bit better uh, and specificity because we can control how much they're breathing on each breath. So the differentiation from one breath to another is not the same. Um, I do not know specifically the sensitivity and specificity for either of those. So. Uh, the next question is, does your approach change based on your pretest probability of the condition? And that says, if, you, if I suspect a DVT or PE, do you still begin by looking for sliding one and then B-line, or rather go right to cardiac and then DVT exam first? And the answer is, of course. We always change uh, what we decide to do by the patient's presentation. So in the patient with a, a recent surgery and a big swollen leg, I think I would probably do their heart exam first and then go on to just do their DVT ultrasound on the leg that has the splint on it and then add any other pieces as I need to. I think that uh, that's the whole key thing of any ultrasound exam at point of care is once you get used to the various portions of it is you just choose the parts that are significant and useful for you on that patient instead of um, sort of adhering to a standardized uh, approach. <laughs> uh, the next question says, any tips regarding non-A, non-B profile being seen at the uh, plaques point, so the kind of a posterior lung point due to transducer positioning? So, uh, and I've experienced this multiple times um, the non-A and non-B profile. So you just kind of see noise when you look at the chest wall. It doesn't, it's not really an A, they're not really A lines, they're not really B lines, it's just kind of noise of the lungs. Uh, in general, that's actually when I find the cardiac and the IVC uh, evaluations to be more useful. I think we see this pattern a little bit better um, in patients who are really severely one disorder or another. So patients who have mixed disorders, they have congestive heart failure, but they also have COPD and some other lung problems that make their congestive heart failure that much more uh, problematic for them. I think that we often run into this problem where we have a sort of a non-diagnostic um, non profile being seen on our ultrasounds, and then we have to sort of put the pieces together with the additional ultrasound pictures. 
when you look at, uh, if you look at the blue protocol by Dr. Lichtenstein, he manages to do everything with just looking at the lungs, the pleura, and uh, DBT ultrasound, which I don't think I'm that good. Um, that's why I have to add in other things, is because sometimes I just can't tell by looking at the other sides of the lung. Other than that, um, mostly what I do, in addition to uh, adding in the other portions of the exam, like the cardiac and the IVC, is if I can't tell by looking at the lung, then I just switch to different areas and try to see different portions of the lung and try to put a better, uh, a better story together from the entire picture instead of just a couple sections. Um, and then another question is, do you change the patient's position from sitting to lying flat during the process? And the answer is it depends on the patient. If the patient, most of uh, the patients who are severely ill are not particularly um, happy to move around positioning, mostly they, they aren't happy with lying flat, and so I end up having to do a lot of their exams sitting up. Um, one thing you can do instead of trying to have them sit up, uh, so in, I'm sorry to go back, uh, better cardiac, you can usually get better cardiac views if you have a patient sit up and then forward. You can, if you can get them to do at all left lateral decubitus, even rolling over a little bit to their side or reaching over and grabbing a bed rail on the other side of the, of the bed, leaning a little bit more to their left, you can often get a little bit more of a one window than you can when they're just sitting flat. Um, you can always try to get them sitting up straight. Sometimes people will tolerate that well. Um, for the most part, I find patients are uh, not really happy about moving around when they're very short of breath. And then um, another question is, do you, you generally ultrasound over specific sections of the lung where crackles are occultated in search for consolidations and bronchograms? And the answer is absolutely. I certainly spend more time over those portions of the lung when my physical exam tells me that there's something there. Um, in general, I think that that works better for the uh, looking for beeline uh, than consolidation. I think prior, uh, similar to the previous question where uh, maybe chest x-rays are better to look for small pneumonias. If that uh, consolidation doesn't extend all the way to the periphery, I think it's hard to find it on ultrasound, um, although you will see the, the focal beelines from it. But uh, I think that the hearing crackles is certainly a, a good reason to look for beelines diffusely in that area. Are there uh, any other questions? I, I think that's it for our time for the day. I think that looks like all we have, Dr. Reeshop. And thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. And our thanks to all of you who participated tonight. Everyone, please remember to complete the post-test and the activity evaluation. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. And please join us again for future webinars. Good night, everyone.